And uh, American 297, can I get the uh, nature of the uh, threat level? Multiple passengers on board have received an airdrop. I'm going to bomb this plane. As a crew member, one of the last things, as you can imagine, you'd ever want to hear is that there's an explosive device on your aircraft. Me, since I fly some high-risk cargo, I transport explosive devices, but it's different because when it's being loaded onto my aircraft, it's being loaded on a way that's not intended to possibly explode, and there's not somebody who's probably mentally ill back there controlling or in control of this explosive device. However, as a crew member, I've never had something like this happen where someone threatened to have a bomb on my aircraft. Watch what happens. Los Angeles, American 297, request. American 297, go ahead. And uh, we're going to need to coordinate to go back to uh, Los Angeles. American 297, Roger, is uh, for the reason. We have a threat level 3 going on, and uh, we'll come back with more information. American 297, Roger. American 297, uh, descent of maintain, fall level 190. These types of videos are always tricky for me to do because when you become an airline pilot, you get some training, and some of that training is information that you're not supposed to disclose to the general public. So you can imagine things like bombs on an aircraft makes it a little bit tricky for me. But luckily, this is on the internet, so we can talk about it. This document is not from work. It's something that I pulled off of the internet. And you can see here, threat level three. They break these threats into different categories because common sense now is just not that common. They don't want to have crew members making up their own plan, meaning they take something that is very serious and treat it like it's not a big deal or something that's not a big deal and taking something, making it sound very serious. So they made it into these different threat levels and then we can act accordingly. If you have a threat level one, for example, where someone is arguing with another passenger, that obviously doesn't warrant the same level of emergency as someone here in threat level four, trying to access the flight deck. That's why the pilot is checking in with air traffic control and saying they have a threat level three. It's kind of a judgment call. As a, as a pilot, you're not gonna wanna get on the radio really and say like, hey, we have possibly a bomb on the aircraft or something like that because there's a lot of people listening. So you kind of have to use some discretion. So he went with the initial thing saying, hey, we have a threat level three, which the air traffic controller should know, hey, this is a very big deal. Watch what happens next. American 297, I have clearance advisor ready to copy. American 297 is ready to copy. American 297, uh, you're cleared now to Los Angeles via right turn, direct rider, and the rider to arrival. Uh, descent and maintain, follow level 100. All right, descent and maintain, follow level 100, right turn, direct rider for the rider to arrival, American 297. American 297, let's verify the uh, flight deck is secure. I'm sorry, you're coming in garbled, say again. American 297, verify the flight deck is secure. Flight deck is secure for American 297. I've talked about this in other air traffic control videos, but it's important to note, as the pilot starts to get busy, he starts speaking a lot quicker. Look at the difference of the way he's talking here. Los Angeles, American, 297 request. Now compare that to the way that he's speaking right here. All right, descent maintain flight level 100, right turn direct rider for the rider to arrival, American, 297. I thought that was interesting to mention because I've heard it in myself as well as I start to get busy or task saturated as we call it. Sometimes you start talking faster because your brain is moving faster. And that's something important for a controller, if they ever are watching these videos, to realize when they hear that pilot start talking really quickly, they're busy, they're handling a lot of different things. And then you heard the other pilot actually pick up that second radio call probably because the other pilot was busy loading up everything in the box, which is the box is what we call kind of like where we have all of our flight plan, plan information. So he was busy doing that and the other pilot picked up the call about the flight deck being secure. And here's why he did that. You can see here having someone on the flight deck would be threat level four, which is the highest risk that a pilot can report. And if you're like me and always a skeptic, you might be thinking, well, what if the bad guy said, oh, we only have a threat level three? Well, a bad guy's not gonna get on the flight deck and make that announcement to start with. So if the controller's asking the pilots, hey, is the flight deck secure? They know at least the pilots are in control of the aircraft. That's a major thing since 9-11. Obviously, you're not gonna want to let someone breach the flight deck and then not do things like, well, you can imagine things that happen if someone were to get onto the flight deck now. But after 9-11, especially with U.S. carriers, I can't imagine a scenario in which passengers let someone force their way onto the flight deck. I just can't see it happening now. Watch what the pilots do here next. And uh, American 297, can I get the uh, nature of the uh, threat level? Multiple passengers on board have received an airdrop. I'm going to bomb this plane. And we have concurred with dispatcher returning back to Los Angeles. American 297, Roger. American 297, uh, contact LA Center on 135.5. 35.5 from American uh, 297. SoCal American 297 is 12.1, descending via the rider 2. We have information. Go back. 
Bearing 797, actually, Bearing 297, SoCal approach, Roger. And you can expect runway 25 left. That's the tower's uh, directive. 25 left, American 297, thank you. Something that's very important here to note is when the pilot says this. And we have concurred with dispatcher returning back to Los Angeles. So when it comes to decision making, the pilots have the final say so of what we're going to do. However, the dispatcher is included and is part of the decision making team with things like this, a situation where you're going to a different location than you were planning to go to. Your dispatcher, think of them as like your, your boots on the ground. That person on the ground can make phone calls to get a hold of people a lot quicker than us, let's say, making a satellite phone call. They're able to get people on the ground to react quicker. They know how to get access to all the different things that we will need. They can get you updated weather or anything that's going on. They're going to be the ones to help you. So when you're making a decision like, hey, we think we should be going back, you have to bring the dispatcher in. You really should bring the dispatcher in and then say, hey, this is what we think to do. What do you think? Yes, we agree. Okay, great. Let's go do this. So that's why it's important to say we spoke with the dispatcher because they're basically showing that they've already spoken with everybody and everybody agrees we need to go back. But when the controller said this, it really surprised me. And you can expect runway 25 left. That's the tower's uh, directive. LA Tower is obviously in control of everything that's going on at that airport, and, and they're not going to want to juggle everything around, but this aircraft, this American aircraft, has now become a priority aircraft, meaning, hey, they're going to get pretty much everything they want. But here's why it surprised me that they picked 25 left. So this flight was headed out to Hawaii, so it's out here. And this is LAX, and this piece of pavement here is 25 left, but it is also 7 right. The numbers of a runway are based on the compass heading that you'd be going. So if you were landing on 25 left, it means you'd be landing and facing to the west. And if you were landing on 7 right, you'd be facing to the east. So that's the same piece of pavement, but it has two different numbers based on the direction you'd be taking off or landing on. Why I'm surprised is because you have the potential threat of a plane with a bomb on it. And in my mind, what would make more sense is to just let the plane fly over the water. So if it does explode, it doesn't impact everyone over LA. And it will also allow the plane to get on the ground a lot quicker because they'd be coming straight in here on the seven right. But instead they're saying, we want the plane to come in over the city and land on two five left. I will say that 90% of the time that I've flown into LA or taken off from LA, you're taking off that direction. You are taking off to the west. So that is the normal flow of the airport. However, if the pilots were to come in on, let's say seven right to do the thing over the water, like I was suggesting, you'd have to at least shut down one whole half of LAX, which would be a major deal. Now, could be wind, could be weather, could be that they don't find it to be that serious, could be a, a lot of different decisions, but the pilots aren't pushing back and air traffic control is saying, plan on this runway, so this is what happens next. Mark 297, descend via and after Cliffy, heading 110, amend altitude, maintain 7,000. All right, descend via and after Cliffy, heading 110, and descend, descend maintain 7,000, American 297. American 297, the rebec is correct. Maintain 250 knots until advised. Maintain 250 knots until advised, American 297. American 297, is there a weapon on board? Uh, we have not been advised of that. Multiple passengers have received a threatening text that there is a bomb threat against the aircraft. American 297, Roger. That controller actually said something kind of technical, so I'm going to break it down in the simplest way possible. What I'm referring to is this part right here. Mark 297, descend via and after Cliffy, heading 110, amend altitude, maintain 7,000. First, the way the controller said it is a little bit jumbled up, and that's not to be critical of this controller. I have jumbled up plenty of clearances before, but typically you'd hear something more like, descend via except maintain 7,000 at Cliffy, fly heading 110. Something more like that is what you typically hear. But essentially, what he's saying is, these pilots are coming in and flying into LAX. So the controller is saying, follow this path, and all of these numbers here are altitudes. So they're supposed to hit each checkpoint at a given altitude, or a range of altitudes. And you see here, the last checkpoint is 6,000 at Gatto. With the controller saying, descend via, he's telling them, descend via that path, hit those different altitudes. And if he had just said, descend via, then the pilots would go to 6,000 because that's the final altitude, but he said maintain 7,000. So when you programming everything into your computer or into your control panel, you're going to put in there to the plane and tell it, okay, descend and follow this path, but I want you to stop at 7,000 feet. 
because that's what the controller is giving you. So that's just so the pilots know you're gonna descend via this path, but stop at 7,000. Then the controller says here at Cliffy, he wants them to turn right heading 110, which means instead of following this path, they're gonna turn this direction and that's gonna get them lined up to land on the runway in the very south part of the airport here. The other thing is the controller said, maintain 250 knots until advised. Listen here. Target 297, the rebec is correct. Maintain 250 knots until advised. Maintain 250 knots until advised, American 297. That's because at points like here at base, you can see here is a number 240 knots, or at Cliffy, 210 knots. That's telling the pilots that they need to be at that speed at each of those checkpoints. I know that could be kind of technical, but I wanted to make sure you understood what's going on. So the controller is letting them go 250 knots because he wants to get them there as quickly as possible without it being a, a risk or a danger of anybody. Flying 250 would be totally normal in a lot of airports. They have it slowed down in bigger airports like LAX, so that way they're able to sequence all the planes in together. So by giving, giving these pilots 250 knots, it's still totally safe but they're doing it so that way the plane can get to the runway a little bit quicker. American 297, uh, say reason why level three threat was declared. I just want to pause this here real quick because me as a pilot at this particular stage, I'd be a bit irritated. I've already advised it's a threat level three. That should be sufficient information to say, okay, well, let's bring them around. Then the controller wants more information. The pilot gives them the information about the airdropping and the threat of there being a bomb on the aircraft. As you can see from this chart here, that would definitely categorize as threat level three. Obviously, there's the risk of someone doing this as a joke or a, a practical joke, if you will. I can't imagine a scenario that someone's gonna do that as a joke because you're talking about a major felony. If you were to get caught for doing something like this, you're looking at some very serious fines and jail time. So with someone making that type of a threat, you have to take them seriously. Here's the pilot's response. Multiple uh, passengers have received a threatening text that there was a bomb threat against this flight, this aircraft, and um, we concurred with dispatch that we should return back to Los Angeles. American 297, thank you. American 297, say fuel on board in minutes. And also, while you guys are pulling that up, um, souls on board when able, please. I know I'm kind of breaking these up into shorter chunks here, but there's another thing here that's really important to understand. These pilots haven't declared a mayday, right? They haven't declared a pan-pan. They haven't declared a mayday or any type of emergency situation. However, the controllers are treating it that way. Obviously, if you have a possible bomb on your aircraft, that's something that's an emergency situation. Anytime that there's an emergency situation, the controller is going to need to know how much fuel do you have on the plane and how many souls do you have on the plane. They're going to have to relay that to the uh, firefighters and the rescue people that are going to be on the ground. Those firefighters and the rescue people that are on the ground need to know how many people are they looking for and, and how much fuel could there be if there's a possible explosion or if this plane needs to do something like fly and hold or whatever. They just need to have all that relevant information. So that's why the, this controller is asking that information from the pilots. Anytime you see something like this at the airport, that means that someone has declared an emergency. Now listen to how this final approach controller handles this plane. American 297, thank you for your help today. Contact approach on 124.9, the information has been forwarded. 249, thank you for the help for American uh, 297. SoCal American 297, 900,000 descending at 7,000. American 297, SoCal approach, feed your discretion all the way to the airport. Expect about a one five mile final. If you need anything else, let me know. Roger, uh, let's see, sending to 7,000 feet our discretion, and uh, let's make sure we have aircraft or uh, airport safety vehicles available. It's going to be an overweight landing. Okay, copy that. I'll pass it along. Everyone's listening, so they'll uh, pass that information. Very good. When a controller tells a pilot, speed your discretion, like right here. American 297, SoCal approach, speed your discretion all the way to the airport. Expect about a one five mile final. He's basically telling that pilot, fly as fast as you want. I mean, within reason, of course. Fly as fast as you want, and that's because earlier you saw those speed restrictions on that approach coming in there. They just want to let these pilots know, hey, you can keep flying 250 knots as long as you want. Now, I have flown with some pilots who love to fly at the very maximum that the plane can go. Uh, Mike, if you're watching, I'm referring to you. But the, here's the reality. You, let's say, were flying 210, flying 240 or 250 isn't going to make a huge difference in this last few minutes of flying. It's not going to really change anything. If you're going across the ocean and you're doing a 10-hour flight, then those types of numbers make a big difference. But on a few last few minutes, it usually doesn't really make a huge difference. Now, 
when I'm doing a flight uh, in the simulator, sometimes we'll simulate something like we've taken off and had a uh, cargo fire, which is, as a cargo pilot, really one of your number one worst case scenarios. Uh, let's say you have a plane full of lithium ion batteries and they've caught on fire just as you got off the ground. That, that's a big problem. So we'll do that. Now, in the simulator, I will fly extremely fast and do all kinds of things to fly as fast as I can come around to land. However, you are really going between the risk of flying so fast that you come back around and then you're not able to land and have to do it again the second time and going so slow that the plane ends up burning up. So it's kind of a delicate balance of what's too fast and what's fast enough. So the pilot getting this go as fast as you want, they fly your speed, that's fine, but it's not really something that you should be then going, okay, let's go extremely fast here as long as possible because you're talking about seconds where it's not really gonna make a huge difference on something this short. Next, I wanna talk about this part right here. Roger, uh, let's see, sending to 7,000 feet our discretion, and uh, let's make sure we have aircraft or uh, airport safety vehicles available. It's gonna be an overweight landing. Planes have a maximum landing weight, and they also have a maximum takeoff weight. As you can imagine, your landing weight is usually a lot less than your maximum takeoff weight because the amount of fuel that you're gonna have on your aircraft. And this plane, planning to fly five hours or so out to Hawaii, they have a lot of fuel on board. So the pilot is saying, we're gonna be having an overweight landing, meaning you are landing over the maximum landing weight of, based on the manufacturer. You're landing over the maximum landing weight, which means not really a big deal. All that's gonna happen is the mechanics gonna to have to do a bunch of extra safety checks. But it's not worth burning a bunch of extra fuel and being up there for another 20 or 30 minutes while some person in the back may be having a mental breakdown with the potential of having a bomb. You're also gonna have people freaking out on the plane. As you can imagine, if multiple people got that airdrop, by this point, everybody on the plane has whispered all the way through, just like a schoolhouse, everybody on the plane knows that there's somebody who's threatened to have a bomb on the aircraft. So people want to get on the ground and off that plane as quickly as they possibly can. So you're not going to want to waste time dumping fuel if this plane even has the capacity to do that because a lot of planes don't. Uh, but you're not going to want to waste time dumping fuel and you're not going to want to waste time just burning gas for nothing. You're going to want to take the overweight landing, let maintenance sort it out, not a big deal, get everybody on the ground, safety is the number one priority obviously. But I like what the controller does right here. American 297, SoCal approach, feed your discretion all the way to the airport. Expect about a one five mile final. If you need anything else, let me know. He's simply just giving these pilots a heads up here. He's saying plan 15 miles so that way the pilots know when they should start to configure to land and they're not going too fast, too long, or anything like that. Now, when you're doing a normal flight, that's not typically something that they're ever gonna give you, but since these pilots, they know are flying a little bit faster than normal, a little bit higher stress level than normal, even though they sound really calm and professional, they're just trying to give them a little bit of a heads up of, hey, this is when I'm gonna turn you in, and 15 miles is plenty of time to get configured to land, but they're not putting them way far out, they're not putting them in too tight into the airport. So, that's all. Listen to this last part here. Los Angeles, American 297 with you. 11 miles outside of GG251. American 297, LA Tower, wind 2407, runway 25 left to the land. Caution with turbulence, heavy 777 departs the parallel. Roger, clear to land on 25 left, American uh, 297. Uh, certified uh, arm equipment is standing by. Arm equipment is standing by, on frequency. Very good, thank you. American 297, right turn, Hotel Niner, Lima, you need assistance? Right turn, Hotel Niner, Lima, for American uh, 297. Does the emergency equipment need to check this out before we go into the gate? It's up to you. Hey, so we'll have them check this out before we go to the gate for American 297. Okay, so now we answer the question of could they have landed on that other runway? The winds were 240, so they were obviously favoring landing on 25. However, most commercial aircraft have at least 10 knots of, of tailwind component, meaning they can land with exactly 10 knots pushing directly on their tail. So if they had came in and shut down the airport, let's say the pilots had said, no, I don't want to do two five left, I want to do seven right, I want to go straight to that runway right now, the controllers probably would have done it if they declared the emergency because if the pilots declare that emergency, then they just have to respect that. So that was a, a potential option for the pilots, but they chose not to do that. Their discretion, nothing to criticize them on, everything worked out fine. However, that would have been a faster, quicker option to get on the ground but the pilots are showed to just fly this rider approach and cut around and land on 2-5 left. Now, if the, if the wind had been 
20 knots or 25 knots or something like that, well, then you're not going to want to do that because now you're running the risk of going off the other end of the runway and taking a potentially no situation and making it a really big problem. Here the pilots ask for the ARF. Verify, uh, ARF equipment is standing by. ARF equipment is standing by on frequency. Very good, thank you. The pilots are asking for the ARF because they're looking for the airport rescue and firefighters. That's something that are those trucks that are usually going to follow any plane when they declare emergency. Those are the people that you want to see uh, when you're coming into land if your plane has a problem because you know everybody's there, focused, ready to go, geared up, and ready in case you have an emergency on board. So they're just verifying that everybody's there just in case there is a problem once they get on the ground. You have people that are there to help out the flight attendants, help out the pilots, and get everybody off of the aircraft. If you enjoyed this video, check out one of these two over here. I look forward to hearing from you. Until then, keep the blue side up.